All right, so this is what our final interface looks like. We have an option right up here to select our input images. So we can select a foreground image. This is actually a pair of images, which is made up of uh, the foreground subject behind the uh, magenta and green background in each pair. Um, so let's select uh, Zelda here, or actually since that's already selected, let's select Chick Girl, just to see a little bit something different here. And then also let's select a different background to switch that up as well. Um, let's go with the mountain road here. Um, so with that we can select our input images, then we have the option to adjust how we blend that subject into the background. For that we have the brightness transfer and color transfer sliders. So if we move the brightness transfer slider here, we can see how the brightness properties um, change. Without it, um, it's a lot brighter and then when we transfer the properties from the background onto the foreground, we sort of transfer that darker look, around, especially visible around the edges here. Um, and we can easily turn it on and off with the checkbox. Same thing goes for color transfer. However, color transfer obviously focuses more on the color. Um, you can also see how it really desaturates the color here and sort of gives it that spooky look of the background. We can also easily turn it off with the checkbox here, showing how it uh, would look without that effect. And then um, to also further improve the blending into the background, we have um, a blur of the edges, which otherwise can look a little bit sharp and um, can fix that by blurring the edges. And then we have a reset button, so if we uh, play around with these settings and we want to reset them to the original settings, which sort of tend to work universally well for all of these foreground and background images, uh, we have the reset button that can reset all of our settings. Um, then we can save an image just using that button. We can also save uh, multiple images, so let's do another uh, pair here maybe. Um, let's increase that transfer here to make it even more spooky and sort of blend into the background there. Uh, we can also save that. So now um, if we go into our folder here, we can see uh, our first output image and the second output image. Um, going back into our UI, if you also want to maybe um, better understand how the process works or fix any problem you might see, you can see process images, uh, which are also really interesting because they allow us to see um, how the process works and sort of what some of the tricks are that we're using here. Which, for example, um, here it's visible that both mats of the um, lighthouse have issues. For the magenta version, we have issues around the door, and for the green version, we have um, problems here with the green brick, which makes sense because both of these areas can be um, mis misidentified as part of the background. However, in the next step, when we get the max maximum of both of those mats, we get a much better result. Um, this is also very visible when we're looking at the paper cube which however doesn't work too well for uh, color transfer, unfortunately. So I'm just going to tone those values down. Um, if you go back here, we can also very clearly see how these areas sort of don't look good because the green blends in with the background and the magenta blends in with the background, so they get keyed out. However, that gets fixed once we get the maximum of the two mats. And we also see how the two backgrounds blend in together to a neutral background color in our um, blend. Um, and then in the final step, we can also see how that color transfer works. So here it's very clearly visible how the color transfer can also lead to undesired results. Essentially what's happening is it's taking these bright areas and trying to also get the brighter areas of our cube to look similarly shiny. However, that leads to some really undesirable um, effects here. Um, so yeah, that is our interface basically. All right, so let's first look at our operators. Um, right here at the top, the first thing we have that's important is our two ranges for the images defining our hue, saturation, and brightness values. So essentially what these are, these are ranges that we sort of handpicked in Photoshop and you just wrote down what the rough ranges of values for the um, hue, saturation, and brightness of our background pixels are. And um, what we have here is in the center, the center ranges are where most pixels are. So any pixel that is within these values gets identified as being part of the background. Um, and then if it's sort of on the outer rims here of, uh, between these two values, it gets identified as a semi-transparent pixel. And anything beyond that is identified as being part of the subject, part of the foreground. We have two values for the green and magenta image. So um, the main difference we're seeing here is in hue, of course. Um, and then if you go down, right, right here we have our chroma key method. Um, this is taken from a lab exercise that we did before. For the most part, um, it's been, not been modified 
uh, from that. The main difference here really is that we are also identifying the background color. Um, and to do that, what we did is we are taking in actually two images as a parameter. Uh, the second parameter is um, the image compare, which is the other image, the image we're not applying the chroma key to. And we're using that image as well to look at both images hue values. We're basically just summing them up and then dividing them by the count of pixels, which we're doing right here. And what that gives us is just the mean hue. So we can compare the two images mean hue and figure out which one is greener and which one is more magenta. And therefore we know um, whether we're currently looking at a magenta or green background. Then we go down here, we look at each pixel individually and we uh, get the chroma key value. So essentially now what we're doing is we're calculating a value between zero and one that represents um, how much the pixel is within its uh, range. So we're looking at channels hue, saturation, and value. Uh, that's what we're doing here. We're kind of going through all three channels and uh, checking where in the range our value is, assigning it either a zero, a one, or a maps number that is between zero and one and represents um, how close to the range it is. And um, we're actually giving our hue a lot of extra weight here. So um, summed up all of our three values, which could be between zero and one, could be between zero and three in total. However, we're actually increasing that number to seven. So our value could be between zero and seven because our value for hue is multiplied by five. So if we have a value between zero and five for hue, a value between zero and one for saturation and brightness in total, that's up to seven. Uh, seven is our maximum possible value. And we're remapping that to a value between zero and one clipping that if it's especially small or large and then returning that value so that is how we achieve our chroma key effect um, then we have a bunch of methods here that are basically implemented like we have done in labs such as generating a pre-multiplied um, image uh, generating a key mix blending images um, the maximum operator is not something we did in lab, but it's also very simple. All we're doing is we're comparing the brightness values of our two images and picking the greater uh, value. Then we have the blur effect, which we've done in lab. The road effect is um, based on a convulsion filter that um, I implemented in code for one of our lab exercises. Um, however, obviously the convulsion filter itself is changed. Uh, we're not blurring or anything like that. Instead, what we're doing is we're checking uh, what our smallest value in our kernel is and just picking that value for the center pixel. And then this is the most complex area of our script, uh, of our code. Um, what we do here is we transfer a color. So to do that, um, we use a handy little uh, method, um, sorry, I had a little class to be found, which is the color space converter class that's based on image J. And it's a library and a class that sort of allows us to convert between color spaces. So what we do is we convert between the RGB and LAB color space, uh, L alpha beta. And that's what we're doing right here. So we're converting both the foreground image and the background image to these color spaces, saving all of the three channels values, and then doing a statistical analysis of these values by calculating both of the images standard deviation and um, also the mean for our target image. And then uh, we go back through each individual pixel. And this time what we're doing is we're transferring the um, statistical properties, more specifically the standard deviation of our source image onto the target image. So essentially what this part here does is it checks how far our current value for the target image is from its uh, mean. It's increases or decreases that distance from the mean based on um, whether or not the standard deviation we have in this image is larger or smaller from the source image. So it's essentially just adjusting the values to match the standard deviation of the source image by applying the offset here that we calculated up here. And then the last step is to simply just convert that back to RGB. And then um, by looking at sort of what we did here, I uh, actually copied that uh, process and the same thing with our brightness values. However, I'm going a step further. I'm actually also applying the same mean of the source image to the target image, not just the standard deviation. I'm also applying the mean and I'm also clipping values. So no value in the target image will be brighter than the source image's brightest pixel. And it won't be um, darker than the source image's darkest pixel. Um, and then down here, we just have a bunch of um, methods that we use to support what we um, do up, up here in the code further up. 
Um, and then going over to the frame class, what we do here is we apply these operators in a certain sequence that gives us the desired results. So this is pretty much talked about in the papers that we implemented. Um, we're doing a basic chroma key, then we're um, blending the foreground uh, results, the foreground um, images into an image with a neutral background color because we use complementary colors. Um, we refine our mat a little bit. That is something that we implemented on our own. Uh, we transfer color and brightness. And then we sort of blend the results based on the slider inputs, and that gives us our final output. Just on a quick note here, um, the only real significant way that the transfer color method has changed since the intermediate progress report submission is that we're now using the L alpha beta color space. Uh, so we discovered that the color space converter class that we're using also has methods to convert to L alpha beta co color space. Um, so for recap, that was a class that we found that can converge between color spaces. Originally, we were converting to the XYZ color space. And I didn't realize, but this probably is an abbreviation for L alpha beta. So um, we now switched to using this method instead, and the results are much better. For our UI, we have four classes. We have our main frame class, and then three classes for the pop-ups, for the background, foreground, and process. Um, in the main class, and in all of these classes, actually, we follow sort of the same layout. Uh, we define variables at the top, so this is uh, things such as swing components. Then we have our constructor. In the frame class, we're also loading images here. We're only doing that in this class. Um, then we set up our swing components, so we're styling them using methods that we defined, add them to the content pane, and then um, we add action listeners or um, change listeners for our sliders and checkboxes, and we're also defining some actions that we want to take when we receive a change. Um, then we have our paint method. What we do here is we paint any components that are not swing components, so that's images and labels mostly. We have a handy method here that draws image pairs for our foreground images. Um, listener methods right here, and then um, our styling methods that I mentioned in the constructor that um, sort of style our swing components. And then we have an image here that scales images with better interpolation results that we can use to um, scale the image without having to uh, use the width and height variables for that. Um, and we have the set foreground and background methods. These are public interface methods and we use them to communicate between our different windows, so the different classes. And the main ways that the UI inputs affect our program is we have two arrays here for our background and foreground images and then two variables that we assign to references from these arrays using our user inputs to pick foreground and background images. And we also have some more variables right down here that affect our process and are also defined by the UI input. And then our pop-up um, classes follow sort of the same layout where we define swing components at the top, set them up in the constructor, add them to the pane, draw any non-swing components in paints, and have uh, listeners and helper methods at the bottom.